Hello, I'm Henry, and I read a book. I read this book, Scott Pilgrim's Finest Hour by Brian Lee O'Malley, and I would like to talk about it, please. So here we are, the last video in this series. We've come a long way on this journey. It's been fun, it's been enlightening, it's been educational. And now, for the last time, can Scott Pilgrim beat Superman in a fight? Even though this is the last video in the series, every video is someone's first video. So I'm going to do a real quick recap of what we're doing here. We've been going through each of the Scott Pilgrim books looking at every superhuman feat he achieves. Then we take those feats, brush off the video gamey aesthetics, and use the superpower wiki to find out exactly what Scott is doing as he is achieving them. After we've done that, we will have a list of refined defined superpowers that Scott Pilgrim is capable of. Looking at that list and comparing it to a list of abilities that Superman commonly has will tell us if Scott can beat him in a fight. Now, seeing as this is the last video in the series, we're going to do things a little bit differently. We normally run through the list of superpowers so far first, then add new stuff from the book that the video is about to that list. But I think we'll do it the other way around here. New stuff first, then the final definitive list of superpowers with the answer to the question at the very end. Sounds good? Sounds good. Let's get to it. First though, mini review. Do you remember how in the last book we didn't have any instances of author Brian Lee O'Malley creepily pointing out a child's age? Well, in this book, we go even further beyond. We get something that I would call genuine self-awareness. This series has been self-aware in all the wrong ways up to this point, with all its pretty unfunny fourth wall breaking. But this, I would say, is good self-awareness. Maybe between the fourth book and this one, someone sat Brian Lee O'Malley down and said to him, bro, you can't have children in romantic relationships with adults and you especially can't keep intentionally drawing people's attention to it like it's cool or funny. This scene however of Scott reflecting on the child he had been going out with now being a legal adult is unfortunately immediately followed by this which if I'm honest pretty much annihilates all of the goodwill this character has built up in the last few books. I understand that he is still at a lowest point here, but this is unacceptable. Finding out that the child you used to go out with is legally not a child anymore and then immediately propositioning them for sex are you serious? That's freakishly creepy if you ask me. Thankfully, nothing unforgivable comes of it, but we do have a bit of a Tristram Thorn situation on our hands here, wherein a character is so deplorable and wrong, I no longer care about their growth or their arc. I don't care if they become better because they don't deserve it. Scott Pilgrim was already flirting with this status, but this incident pushes him well over the line. I hate him and always will now. This panel sums things up, I'd say. That and that includes you line, is meant as a joke, obviously, but in the grand scheme of things, it isn't really one. And Scott crossing this line really does color your opinion of the rest of the book because it happens so early. He also regresses maturity-wise to an insufferable degree. And I understand that this is set up for a positive change at the end where he's a more whole person. But as I just said, he has crossed the line for me and now I do not care about whatever positive change he has. He gets a happy ending and I don't want him to have it. Some of the side characters do conclude their arcs in more positive ways, Knives, Chow especially, but they are overshadowed by this pustule of a main character. It's funny to have come full circle on this guy. I hated him, I started to like him, and at the end, I hate him again. It's a shame. The series as a whole, well, I think it tracks quite well with how I feel about Scott as the main character, though not nearly as intensely. I disliked it, I started liking it a bit more, then I went back to disliking it a bit. A series of ups and downs with slightly more downs than ups. Okay, that's my thoughts. On to the superpowers. The first superhuman thing we see from Scott in this book is him manifesting a negative version of himself. It is a physical, tangible manifestation of all of his negative thoughts and mistakes that takes the form of a dark Scott. It is a separate being that can interact with the world around it. For this, the superpower wiki has something called inner darkness externalization and reads the user can materialize their dark thoughts slash emotions into physical darkness and externalize or project it in different forms and it has the following applications 
Darkness attacks, darkness solidification, darkness weaponry, darkness ranged weaponry, personal darkness, umbra kinetic constructs. Now, I don't think Scott is actually capable of any of these things, but that is absolutely not saying that this ability is useless. In fact, I think it is huge. Have you ever played Elden Ring? Well, in that game, there is a mechanic where you can summon creatures and warriors to fight alongside you against bosses. And the best summon in that game is one called the Mimic Tear, because it summons a copy of yourself with all of your abilities and gear. It was so overpowered that even after being nerfed heavily, it is still by far the best summon in the game. This negative Scott is Scott's Mimic Tear. It goes toe to toe with him in a fight. A fight that only ends because Scott realizes the error of his ways not because he actually beats it, which means this negative Scott is at his exact level. So now Superman's got to contend with two Scots. This is no joke. The next superhuman thing Scott does is die. Well, it's not the death, it's the coming back to life. Remember when Scott got an extra life? Well, he finally uses it and he gets another go. This means Superman will have to kill Scott four times to win their fight. Why four times? Well, twice for Scott, and twice for negative Scott. This is an enormous hurdle for the Man of Steel. The next thing that we get is confirmation that Scott has got subspace inside of him so he can access it anywhere because Ramona pops out of him. And he even has access to Ramona's subspace, not that that would be a factor here. Scott loses his power of love sword, but he gains a different one, the power of understanding, giving him plus one to guts, plus three to heart, and plus two to balls. I'd say this leaves him pretty much on as even with the last sword. And that's it. There aren't any more new superhuman things that Scott does in this book. He fights the last Evil X and displays more superhuman physicality, but nothing more than we've seen from him already. I mean, it's a lot more cinematic and epic, but it isn't anything bigger than punching a hole in the moon. Now, if you're astute, you will have noticed that we haven't actually mentioned the save point that he saw in book three, I think. He can see them, and that's it. Weird thing to put in if you're not going to use it. Check off save point. Don't show your character seeing a save point in book three if they're not going to use it in book six. It's a bit weird. I suppose we'll take it off the list. Speaking of the list, now that we're done with this last book, we can confidently say we've got a definitive, detailed list of the exact superpowers that Scott Pilgrim has and can confirm just how superhuman he is. Number one, Scott has access to subspace. It is a parallel slash pocket dimension that allows him to travel great distances in no time at all. He can pop out of it in all different angles, he could trap Superman inside it, and can fight just as powerfully inside as outside. Scott being his own subspace conduit slash embodiment is confirmed in this book, so there shouldn't be any limitations on his use of it, other than it making him feel a bit sick. It's also implied that everyone has their own subspace dimension, so if Scott can get into Superman, he could mess him up good and proper on the inside where Clark isn't a bulletproof demigod. Number two, limited fourth wall manipulation. Scott, along with most of the characters in this series, can break the fourth wall, but he can also control it to some degree. He is aware of real world literary devices and can think them into existence in his world. It only seems to revolve around these real world literary devices though. He can't do anything more than that, like freely manipulate his own reality, which is why we are calling it limited fourth wall manipulation. Number three, the upper end of a supernatural body. Scott physically defeated a guy who punched two holes in the moon, and he can dodge and block attacks from someone moving so quickly they are imperceptible to the naked eye. Scott is a physical match for Superman strength, speed, durability wise. Number four, basic to advanced force field generation. Scott and his friends are able to create an energy deflecting force field, which may not be able to block a punch from the Man of Steel, but could easily block his laser eyes. Number five, illusion manipulation. Scott can create after images of himself. He's unable to move at the speed of light, which is the only other way to create after images like this. So the only other explanation, he is conjuring them with illusion based magic. Superman does not like magic, illusion magic in particular. Number six, items. Scott can use items. As we went over earlier, Scott lost his previous item, the power of love sword, what a save! I was offside. But he gains the power of understanding sword, which as far as we're concerned is the same thing. Offering him a weapon, a weapon is a plus in any fight, as well as buffing his mentality, his determination, and his will to win. Number seven, save point inter- Oh no, this shouldn't be here anymore. Let's just 
Number seven, an extra life. Scott can come back to life. I shouldn't really have to explain how much of a game changer this is. It's only one, he's not immortal, but even still. I said it when we were going through the new stuff in this book, but it essentially means Superman has to kill Scott twice. Well, this Scott twice. Number eight, alchemy. When Scott kills a person, they become coins. This is Scott transmuting matter. This is Scott rearranging atomic structures to turn one element into another. Superman's atomic structures may be different to a human's, but they are still atomic structures. Atomic structures that Scott can change. Number nine, negative Scott. We discussed this earlier too, but Scott just having another version of himself on the battlefield is huge. Even if negative Scott doesn't have any of the abilities that usual dark clothes have, just being able to punch as hard as regular Scott, and it can punch as hard as regular Scott, is enough. And if it's got an extra life too, Superman's got to kill this thing twice as well. Even if we don't give it Scott's other abilities, just its physicality is enough. So with all this stuff, all these abilities, the subspace, the fourth wall manipulation, the supernatural body, the force field generation, the illusion manipulation, the sword, the extra life, the alchemy, the negative clone. Can Scott Pilgrim beat Superman in a fight? Yes. You heard it here first, people. Scott Pilgrim could beat Superman in a fight. I think over the course of these six videos, I've outlined enough evidence to back that statement up. Scott can do such an impressive array of things. He's versatile and adaptable and could win the fight in a bunch of different ways. He could use his illusions to trick Superman into getting stuck in subspace. He could break the fourth wall and request a deus ex machina that would allow him to get a shot off that turns Superman into coins. That's all on top of two Scott who both need to die twice to be beaten properly, both punching Superman really hard. I think it's pretty much cut and dry, to be honest. Obviously, we're talking about standard Superman because we're talking about standard Scott Pilgrim. We don't have any reference for an Omega level, hyper mega maximum overcharged version of Scott Pilgrim. So we can't compare him to a version of Superman like that that I'm pretty sure exists. I think I've seen a panel of Superman pulling the whole universe with a big rope, Scott couldn't beat that. In a fair fight though, I reckon he could. Well, this was fun, wasn't it? I only really started these Scott Pilgrim videos because they're books that I can read quickly to fill the time between books that take me longer to read. But this turned into a bit of a thing, didn't it? Bittersweet to see the end of it. Don't worry though, the schedule shouldn't change. I've got something to replace this series for the weeks between other videos. Here's a hint. <laughs> Hello everyone, thanks a lot for getting to the end of the video, like and subscribe and all that good stuff. Apologies if I'm a little bit sweaty, it's hot in here and I can't open the windows without letting in every single sound in the whole of London. Scott Pilgrim, done. Next video, movie one. Next video, the thing that's replacing the Scott Pilgrim ones. See you there.